like you, I'm teaching at the university, yeah. but uh, you have my biggest respect for a very special reason, all you sitting in here as science teachers. And the reason why I have so much respect, and I really think you are probably one of the most important audiences I ever had in my career, is in this little box here. But I won't tell you for now what's in there. So let's keep a little secret. So first of all, maybe I should give you a little background so you know who is here. My name is Gerda Grimmer. I'm an analog astronaut of the Austrian Space Program, which means in analogy to future missions, we are actually now studying the workflows, the processes, the materials. One day, 20 or 30 years from now, people might use a Mars to look for signs of life, if life ever evolved there. there, there. So that's my usual working gear, that's uh, 45 kilograms, takes about uh, three hours to put it on, and yes, you can eat and drink and sleep and go to the toilet in the space with it, so we do parabolic flights to study microgravity, so there's lots of fun stuff we do, but I'm here to, to work. So let me give you a little bit of a, of a perspective of where we are heading to, at least mentally, and I'd like to take you away 380 million kilometers to give you a little bit of context of what this is all about. If you look at Mars, um, it has a, uh, it's about half the size of Earth, which means if you are introducing a topic like this to your students, you can give them numbers or simply figure, have them figure out what they can do if a planet is only half the size of Earth. For instance, if you have only one half of the size of Earth, you have about one third of the gravity on Earth, which means you can pull ups without proper training, you can go climb on Mars, you can go skating on Mars on CO2 ice caps, and because the remnant parts of your skin, of your, um, of your sliding shoes, are exerting so much pressure with CO2 ice, there will be a huge cloud coming beyond, uh, above you, uh, when you think about the, the phase transitions of CO2, and because of only one third of the gravity, you can do loopings when you, when you swing on the South Pole, for instance, if you like. So a lot of crazy things you can do, and that might spark the imagination. And the bottom line of this is it makes the students rethink things that are come natural to us on Earth, like gravity. It's such an obvious thing, but if you switch it off by going to space, things change very dramatically. So, when you look at Mars, uh, there's a few things that remind us of Earth, for instance, uh, the polar caps I just mentioned, it's mostly CO2 ice uh, on top of it with some water ice below. There are mountain ranges like this here, this is the largest mountain chain in the solar system, the, the Tharsis region, including the biggest mountain or shield volcano to be more precise in the solar system, the Olympus Mons. This thing here is about three times the altitude of Mount Everest with a baseline of 600 kilometers. Entire France could sit in there. And if you, and some of my students actually did a, a study when you go on like mountain biking, how to get up there. It's a two week tour actually, to get up in the calderas of Olympus Mons. And once you're up there at night, you will see stars, you will also see shooting stars. The difference is they're not above you, but they're below you because you're almost outside the little atmosphere Mars has, for instance. Um, you know, if you like to go like bungee jumping, you might choose the Valdez Marineries here. This Graben, which is the tectonical fault basically, if this is so big that if this is Los Angeles, New York would be here. It's the size of the continent of the United States with 8 kilometers depth. You could almost fit entire Mount Everest down there. The bottom line of this is, um, Mars right now is a world that is very cold, minus 7 degrees, minus uh, average temperature. Um, it's a very dry world, it's a very radiation poisoned world as well, as well. But because we have so many assets on the Martian surface, like rovers like this, the Mars Science and Curiosity, it's the biggest rover we ever sent there. Uh, by the way, if you have Transformers movie uh, fans in, in the audience or in, in your classrooms, Mars is the only planet exclusively inhabited by robots right now. Uh, and so we really call it an invasion from Earth in a way. And so all the data we're getting from decades of Mars exploration is that Mars might now be a cold by world, but it wasn't like this all the time. We have very good reason to believe that Mars once, about 3.5 billion years ago, was a, a world where we had oceans. There was, there was long-standing lakes, there were rivers flowing, there were active climate cycles, which were downlining afterwards. So yes, you could go deep sea diving on Mars 3.5 billion years ago. 
The bottom line of this is actually if it's warmer there, if there's water there, if they have had higher density in the atmosphere, the magnetic field is still intact and all managed afterwards. It basically had all the ingredients that were necessary for the start of life. So what if there would have been a second genesis, so to say, on Mars? Or what if, take this one step further, what if Mars first developed life and then because of shallow impacts, which are excavating some of the Martian uh, soil uh, rocks into open space with their very shallow impacts, and some of this material can land on Earth. That's the reason why we have Martian meteorites on Earth, so to say. What if life first started on Mars and then it infected Earth? So we are the Martians. <laughs> okay, so the, 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 the idea is that these are questions where we don't know the answer, but that's the very reason why we are going. We are the first generation after 30,000 generations of Homo sapiens sapiens on this planet, which have the technical means to do this step to get there and do the ultimate voyage of our generation. And that's where our work comes in, and that's a work which is not only relevant for researchers and academics, but also for us as a society as well. And that also includes working with the very generation that is about to set foot on the, on the red planet for the first time. So this is, again, my, my, my work. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a few minutes of, of crash course of what my students usually take entire semester to learn. Uh, how this uh, how this basically was built. And by the way, if such a topic interests you, at uh, 11.30 there's a workshop right in here uh, about how to build a spacesuit, just in case you're interested and you want to have some Halloween costume for next year. Okay, um, so it's a 50 kilogram spacesuit simulator. There's only uh, two research grade devices like this on this planet. Um, we have built a system which is able to sustain life for quite a long time. Uh, it's a complex machine is actually a spacecraft to wear, so to say. It's just, just a few impressions from, our, from a space laboratory with all the exocon and put on lots of measurements you're doing. Sometimes you have to take risks and that's something that is a concept we don't really communicate a lot in science mm -hmm. because you might not have all the Yana Jones in your school classes, but for instance, if you go to Mars, there are dust devils which can be electrically charged and they can discharge lightning strikes. And you cannot run away from a, from a dust devil, can you? And so you have to build a space so that is also a very good Faraday cage and you have to test it on Earth because one of the reasons why we're doing all of our work is that we want to fail fast, fail cheap, but not before we go to Mars. So we have to thank for, for every mistake we're making to make sure it's not going to happen on the red planet. Now, for instance, uh, discharge a six megavolt Tesla call onto a human. That's something, don't try this at home without a spacesuit, please. Because there are people who don't have, you know, suffered significantly from this. And I'm very happy to report that this test went well and I'm still alive to talk about it today. Um, so we have a large background team. It's about 200 people for this type of missions when we're going into Mars-like areas. Like uh, last year we were in Oman. Uh, for one month in a mission that was involving people from 25 nations, including also high school students that were, it was a program we called the Junior Researchers Program, where they were able to submit research proposals, and we took them along the way just like an, an like, like a, accomplished scientist, where they write proposals, go through it, uh, age uh, adjusted uh, peer review, review process, build the harbor, document it, train the analog astronauts, receive the data in the mission supports, and then analyze them, and then even publish. Um, and so it was like taking them through the entire life cycle of a research project. And if you ask why we went to Oman, well, this picture on the upper side was taken on the 15th of February 2018 in Oman, and the picture below was taken one week afterwards on Mars. So these pictures are one week apart but two worlds apart. And so they, they, these are not Photoshop. This is what it looks like there. So that's one of the reasons why we go to those really majestic uh, locations. And uh, we bring our infrastructure. This is the base station we built. The chart for this mission it was called the Kepler station because we had the anniversary of the 500 years of Kepler's third law of uh, celestial mechanics. Um, and uh, build up a station there which would be our home on Mars for quite some time and wherever you want to walk out, you need to do this in a spacesuit, otherwise you are very fast, very dead. Um, at least and so we build up infrastructure, you do a number of experiments there like flying a drone, and yes, you can fly drones on Mars with 
specific technology that, that is possible in the you know, they look into all types of how to acquire geological samples, the right geological samples, uh, how to drive rovers, how to have autonomous rovers driving with you. We also had uh, food experiments like with the, uh, this Horn Extreme experiment from the Italian Space Agency where we would be able to, to have a, a greenhouse in the middle of the desert, uh, which was controlled by a satellite from a mission support center in Rome, actually, by our, our Innsbruck. And it would actually adjust, you know, nutrients addition, uh, UV sterilization, all those things to really have something grow. And it's a very rare occasion in my profession that we can that we, that we get to eat our experiments. Uh, and I can tell you, after three weeks of freeze-dried food, you would kill for such a salad. <laughs> And so again, you have a large team in the background with mission support center people. We have a strict training. Uh, we have very carefully selected and uh, trained people with Colorado gas products. So that this is one step ahead of what, as I said before, will be probably the greatest journey of our generation yet to come. So that one day, and this is the reason of our work, we are not the ones who will do the, the voyage because I might be too old to set foot on Mars when it happens. But we strongly believe the very first, first human to set foot on Mars is already born. And with some luck, that very person will see this picture with their own eyes. And this is a sunset of Mars taken with a camera which is roughly the same viewing angle like the human vision. So that's somewhat what humans could see when they arrive on their planet. And if that person waits for another half hour or so until the sunset has happened, he will see the stars just like on Earth. So the, the starry sky is almost the same like on Earth, with one big exception. You obviously cannot see Mars in the sky because you're standing on it, but you get an additional little dot in the sky and that's the Earth. And that's what is there. This is a picture of the Earth taken from Mars. That's all you, that's a selfie. That the biggest selfie ever taken with six million people on it. Um, including all of you, I hope you're all smiling when it happened. And that's the very reason why uh, why I admire this is what you're doing. First of all, it's it's in the, about the science. Yeah, this feeling of really discovering something new, something I would really like to invigorate in you. This is a picture almost 100 years old. This was taken in 1923 when a team of Howard Carter entered the graves and the great pyramids of opening the uh, the, uh, the burial chamber of Tutankhamun. This seal was unbroken for 3,225 years. And now imagine being the researcher to go through that door and discovering something new, or something in that case that was long forgotten for thousands of years. We say the first human on Mars yet is, yet, is already born. And that means if you are a science teacher these days, and I guess most of you will have kids at the age of, let's say, 10, 15 years or so. If we say the first human to walk on Mars will be doing this grand journey, let's say, 20 to 30 years from now, and that person is, let's say, 45 years or 40 years, that means this human, uh, this girl or this boy is now 10, 15 years old, which is exactly your client base in a way. Now imagine you are now imagine you are the teacher going back from the science on stage portugal going back to your classes and maybe talking about space exploration and this girl or boy gets inspired starts to start studying a stem subject becomes an astronaut is chosen for the very first mission on mars and 30 years from now you're a little longer retired but then you're sitting in your you know, your chair at the fireside watching the 3D in the real time the landing of Mars. And now this student of yours is landing on Mars. And um, I, before I finish the story, I actually what I have in this here, in this box here, and you can take a look at it afterwards if you like at the break, is an actual Martian meteorite. This little piece of rock does not belong to our planet. And so this is one of those pieces I mentioned before that got ejected from a very shallow impact and most of its brothers and sisters get lost in space and a tiny fraction that just made it to Earth and we have good reason to believe it is actually from Mars. Now imagine your students stepping out, doing the first step in the sand, planting a flag of whatever country and uh, saying the words for, the, uh, the, words for the, the history books and then the camera switches off. And then your students tumble around in their spacesuit 
taking out that very box, taking out the little rock there, and uh, putting it down in the sand, saying, you're home again. <laughs> and that, that's because of you. Because you, it's still that very spark, many years before the voyage happened. And that's the reason why I'm both from <laughs>